Welcome to Wise Up Governance and Boards podcast, brought to you by Three Wise Owls Governance Consultants, covering hot topics in governance, risk, latest regulatory changes, and issues keeping directors and executives awake at night. Here are your hosts, Ainsley Cunningham and Deb Anderson. Welcome to another episode of Wise Up. Today we're joined by Dan Carroll. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Ainsley. Dan is a chartered accountant with over 30 years experience. Prior to retiring some five years ago, he was a partner in Grant Thornton's assurance division in Brisbane. His role required him to demonstrate excellent business development, client service, technical and interpersonal skills. His business development activities at Grant Thornton focused on medium to large size private and public companies. Services provided to his clients included statutory audit and review opinions, review reports, agreed upon procedures reports and financial due diligence. He has developed significant expertise in a wide range of industries including property and construction, heavy engineering, manufacturing, mining and resources, freight and logistics, agriculture, meat, cotton and sugar and service industries. During his career he was often asked to provide advice on the application of IFRS accounting standards and presented many accounting and auditing standard technical update sessions for and on behalf of both the AICA and CPA in Australia. His position at Grant Thornton provided him with a wide exposure to all elements of professional practice management, including managing people, divisional production and divisional budgeting reporting. Since retiring to spend more time with his family, Dan has taken on several non-executive board roles – The most significant of these is that he is current State Treasurer and State Council Member for Vinnie's here in Queensland, an organisation which currently has a turnover of $300 per annum and net assets exceeding $400 There he chairs the Finance and Risk Committee and also is a member of the Property Committee. Dan is a member of the Finance and Investment Committees for two independent schools in Brisbane, namely Somerville House and Villanova College. He is also a non-executive director on a number of private company groups. In his free time, Dan loves to travel with his family and has two trips now deferred due to the coronavirus. Reading, drinking fine red wine and watching live sport. Wow, Dan. Welcome. Thank you, Ainsley. Corona's throwing a curveball in there, isn't it? You can't travel? No, we can't. We had uh, two trips organised this year, one for our 30th wedding anniversary uh, which has been deferred indefinitely. That was to Cuba. Uh, we suspect probably sometime next year. But you've got your live sport back. We have finally got the live sport back, <laughs> albeit that we can't see any crowd. And you can still get red wine home delivered. We do indeed. <laughs> Very good. So, Dan, over to you. Uh, tell us a bit about your role at Vinnie's and um, your response to COVID. Ainsley, where do I start? Um, you know, Vinny is a very multi-faceted organisation and typically we're known for people who go out to those in need. So when you ring 1800 Vinnies and request a food parcel or something uh, of, of need, then we have 8,000 volunteers in Queensland who go out the next day and, and do a home visitation. That's obviously had to stop. Uh, most of our uh, volunteers are... What I'd probably say in the more vulnerable category in corona, they are typically over 50 to 60 plus. And as soon as the uh, corona uh, event came uh, to us, effectively they just stayed at home. No volunteers, we can't provide a service. So initially it was all about panic. Um, Our services are funded primarily because of a a fairly extensive retail shop uh, network within Queensland, 158 shops prior to COVID, and they're staffed by volunteers primarily. No volunteers, we had to shut the shops, and that's significant. So the initial reaction from the board uh, was, where do we start if we've got no shop revenue? Uh, And therefore, you've got to do a worst-case cash flow scenario, and when you do that, it doesn't look good. Absolutely. So how have you guys um, repositioned? Well, initially... To address the cash flow issues, um, we sought an immediate line of credit uh, from a financier who had been looking to uh, provide us finance. We are a very conservative organisation, so we've got capacity to borrow. 
I think, fortunately, we're not likely to uh, use that line of credit. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's several million dollars just in the back pocket. Uh, we initially put all of our capital expenditure on hold. Um, and in terms of our retail offering, the bit largest expense is uh, rent. So we initially got onto the front foot, wrote to all the landlords, uh, requesting a 50% rate reduction for the six-month period that we thought uh, we were going to be in trouble. Were they quite helpful in providing that? Deb, they were very helpful. Uh, We had probably 80% of people, landlords, who were very agreeable. Uh, 50% obviously better than nothing. Um, But by the same token, most landlords, being what they are, they've also requested extensions of lease uh, period and other uh, concessions from us going forward, not necessarily in this six-month period. And the other 20% that didn't agree... Um, what were still their negoti- reasoning? Still got negotiating with them, uh, Ainsley. Right. Uh, but that's that's also as part and parcel of the whole COVID uh, reaction. Mm. We've had to go into what I think is, the, the first stage is probably damage control and say, well, how can we sustain ourselves initially for the, the first six months and then how do we come out of it uh, going forward? And that might mean that we permanently close some shops. And um, with... Um Shop closures, have you had to make any redundancies in that regard? Or Unfortunately, we took a six-month horizon um, to say what's, what's the worst-case scenario in six months. And I think in the, uh, in the first lot, we unfortunately had to retrench about 39 staff. And that's very difficult. Uh, you know, for a charity particularly that specialises in helping those in need, all we are, you know, at that point in time, we actually made 39 families um, dependent on welfare. Title to the JobKeeper payment? We, d- we were, um, because as soon as you've cut out the shop revenue, we, uh, our revenue base was decimated. Uh, obviously, people don't have enough money or uh, as much money these days because of the uncertainty, and therefore all of our donations also dwindled. So, yes, we did qualify for JobKeeper, um, but that's just in a, a, temporary, a temporary hole for six months. But, yes, um, you know, we had uh, in-house... People look at the legislation, which was changing daily. Uh, it, it's very difficult to react so quickly. And that's also fed through into uh, the regularity of how often we meet. Uh, quarterly state council meetings became fortnightly, and that's a big change. And how has everyone been coping with that, like all your board members and management teams, etc.? I think the biggest uh, lesson that we've learned, Ainsley, is we have to communicate every decision that we make, uh, decisions to our staff, to our stakeholders, and, uh, and to make, make sure that everyone is aware of our, the board's position and uh, where, where we're going. So you've got to drag everyone along for the journey. Mm. But in terms of um, meeting, we've used a combination of software, Zoom, Skype, Microsoft for Teams, InBoard. Every, every board that I'm on has a slightly different process. Uh, board members have had to become very courteous in the way that they transact because you can't all speak at once. And for a lot of our older uh, or more mature board members, that's a bit of a, a challenge. Um, Back to the classroom style, raise your hand, or uh, how does that go? It, we, in some boards, it's as simple as that. You raise yeah. your hand. Uh, if you're not speaking, you unmute or, or mute your microphone so you don't get any background noise. But in, in the early days when we were all coming to grips with the new software, there were certain people who carried laptops around the house, so we got house viewings and... You know, <laughs> the because, ceiling fans. And the ceiling fans, that's right. You know, they can't see us, but we could see the ceiling fan and you know, turn up your laptop. And, but that's... Uh, that's Hopefully all. it was all above board, the viewings in the background. It was. We didn't have any of those things that often get reported on the, on the social media platforms. So in terms of... Um, the new normal and how Finney's might be transitioning back to the new normal. What, um, how do you see that path playing out? That's a very difficult question. Um, will we ever get back to where we were in terms of our procedures and operating style? Potentially no. Uh, there has been a greater focus on um, what, is, what is really our core mission and therefore we've really had to look and have a look at um, you know, what's really important 
some of those pro- programs may in fact uh, be um, cancelled going forward. We just don't don't really know. I'd like to think that within you know, three months we will be back to where we were and, and how we used to service our people. Uh, one of the big things, I, I spoke about home visitations earlier, um, because we weren't in fact able to do face-to-face meetings, we would consult with people over the phone, find out what their needs were. We'd actually make a food drop out the front of their house and make sure that they're in, inside the house, but there wasn't any face-to-face. So we had to just change our procedures um, in a handling food, we have to be a little bit more cautious when we're dealing with food in pantries. Yeah. Um, and I think those those health uh, changes, I think they're probably with us for forever. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really brought into the forefront um, just extra precautionary measures for um, the society as a whole, really. I think so. People are a little bit more polite. People have uh, restored their their uh, personal space of one and a half metres. Um, and I think that's probably one of the societal changes going forward. Absolutely. And I think too just the etiquette around, um, you know, being sick in general. Uh, growing up in the country in the 80s, I had a very strict grandmother who every time you looked sideways you had to wash your hands and use a hanky and sneeze correctly and cough correctly and constantly wash your hands every time that you sort of turned up at the dinner table or turned up inside the house. or So I think it's actually just returning to a better level of etiquette. I've heard that being said by a lot of our elderly volunteers that we're going back 50 years in terms of social, social behaviour. And that's probably a good thing. Absolutely. So have Finney's had to revisit their strategy? That's part and parcel of our an ongoing board discussion. Um, in terms of our setting our focus for going forward, what's really important to us, uh, it's a good good opportunity. Every strategy should be reviewed at least, I believe, annually. We have a five-year strategic plan, uh, but we've actually brought that forward to make sure that when we come out of this COVID uh, environment, we're a much better, stable, sustainable organisation. And um, with the upcoming CEO sleep out. Um how have you been impacted by that? Uh, what are the changes in terms of how you're doing things differently this year? Actually, one of the, uh, the, the CEO Sleepout is a national uh, run um, fundraising night for us. Um, I think from memory there were about nine locations nationally last year. Um, we have one on the Gold Coast, one in Brisbane. Uh, coincidentally, for this Thursday night on the 18th of June. Now, typically... In Brisbane, we'd get 350 CEOs come for a presentation. We put them through a bit of a, a training exercise, particularly making them aware of you know, what homelessness really looks like to try to give a human face to homelessness. Most CEOs, unfortunately, we, we, well, we even when I was working, I'd, I'd arrive at work at 7.30 in the morning, I'd arrive home at 7 o'clock at night, and I didn't see homelessness. It's only when you look for it you actually see it mm. quite a bit. The CEO sleep out this year, uh, last or last year in Queensland, we raised one and a half million dollars through our very generous supporters. This year, I think our budget's probably likely to be three hundred thousand. So we are going to be significantly down on where we were last year, and it's a real shame because we can see that the need for those services, particularly post COVID and post uh, government stimulus in September, the need will in fact quite uh, quite exponentially increase. So we gave all our CEOs, um, because most of them had volunteered before COVID, the option. They can either sleep in their car, which unfortunately many families have to do, or they could sleep on their sofa um, to uh, be effectively a couch surfer for the night, or you can stay outside in your own backyard or front yard, as the case may be. I'll be pitching my two-man tent on Wednesday and um, hopefully survive the night on Thursday night. And um, how are you interacting with the CEOs during this period? Are you going to do a bit of a Zoom call or something like that um, to sort of or get feedback from anybody or are you getting anyone to take personal video diaries that you might share post-event? Or That's all part part of our communications team. Uh, Yes, there will be um, some some linkages through people in their various modes of uh, homelessness on that particular night. Uh, but I think that's really a work in progress at this point in time because everything's changing on a daily basis. Yeah, so you mentioned you 
changing your communication strategy? How are you communicating differently with your stakeholders at present? It's very difficult. Um, our CEO, at, at least for our uh, 2,000 workers and 8,000 volunteers in Queensland, we in fact have a weekly um, email that goes out just to advise our staff and our stakeholders exactly what's happening. Uh, we have progressively opened the shops now. Um, and in really, really pleasing news, we had almost record weeks the first two weeks of opening. So I, I suspect that there's a pent-up demand for our services. Uh, we don't know whether that's necessary from current shoppers or people who used to shop at Vinnie's or potentially, um, sadly, those people who have, have significantly reduced their salaries and are looking for cheaper options. So have you found that people have used the opportunity being at home to get together donations of clothes and toys and things to take to the shops? Uh, Deb, we, we have. Um, at, at least that's what we hear. Um, but unfortunately, when we close the shops, we also close the bins because if there's no one to collect them, we didn't want huge piles of leftover um, you know, donations being exposed to the elements. But uh, we, we have seen a lot of donations in the last two weeks. So are you reopen for donations now as well, Dan? Progressively, Ainsley, I think uh, from memory last week we had 80 stores open of our 150, mm-hmm. so only half of them are still open. Uh, uh, half, half of them are still closed. Mm-hmm. So for those ones that are open, yes, donations are being received. And um, have you had to uh, adopt additional measures to accept those donations? Yes, we have. Uh, you know, books have to be quarantined effectively in the back of the store for three days. Yes. Uh, they get specially wiped down. Every, you know, all the staff are now equipped with cleaning gear. Um, things that we didn't necessarily do in the past. Mm. And if people wanted to make monetary donations to Vinnie's, Dan, where do they go to? CEOsleepout.org.au uh, um, and search my name if you like and put it against my name. <laughs> uh, or alternatively, um, vinnies.org.au will also take general donations, uh, which is a national website. Great. We'll look you up and... Send some um, dollars your way for I'll, I'll camping be, out in the tent for I'll the I'll be evening. looking for your name after Thursday <laughs> night, <actually. laughs> So in terms of investment in the market in general, Dan, um, have you noticed there's been a bit of a change um, in sort of stocks and the stock market in general? Uh, I can't give you any investment advice. No, <laughs> it's not investment <laughs> advice, Dan. General <laughs> advice only. Oh, look, um, earlier this year... We were faced globally with um, fairly significant, um, you know, things overseas. We've got the Brexit, the uncertainty of Brexit, what that really meant for the Euro, um, for the UK market. We had the ongoing tensions between China and the US, and what that did to the US market. Uh, currencies were all over the place, uh, and yet we saw equities up until COVID really stay stay the course which we thought was quite surprising. But with that great uncertainty, most of the boards um, that I was involved in, and as as you said at the outset, I mean, you know, on quite a number of the investment committees of those companies, we decided to go quite defensive. And that's primarily taking money out of the equity market and putting it into cash and fixed interest. So initially when the, uh, the real COVID swipe came and equity markets were smashed, 25 to 30 percent globally and indeed in Australia. Uh, the Vinnie's portfolio in that March quarter only suffered an 11 percent decrease because we were quite heavily exposed to defensive and not the more growth stocks. Having said that, um, I'm always a glass full sort of character, <laughs> and uh, you know, we're now seeing equity markets which are probably 20 percent or 15 percent lower than what they were pre COVID. Now, if one of the department stores had a 20 percent sale, um, my wife and uh, my daughter would be bashing down the bashing down the doors to get a bargain. So one would suspect that you know, the equity market is probably in a a bargain situation at the moment, and yet no one's buying. Yeah, absolutely. And going forward, do you think that we will ever return to some sort of state of normal? Or that's a very difficult thing to say. I think economically we will. It'll, it'll take some time. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. 
you don't just recover from a major economic catastrophe like we have uh, overnight. You know, I hear that the forecasts are that the, the British market this year will be 20% down. That's their worst economic result for 300 years. Wow. Now, you, you just can't open up and, and pretend that things are going to go back to normal straight away. No, it's very much an unknown space, isn't it? In the US markets. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, some of the lessons that we're probably likely to learn from, from COVID is that, you know, maybe we should be valuing our health workers much more. Uh, maybe footballers at the risk of getting myself into trouble, but you know, maybe footballers aren't worth $2 million a year. Uh, we've, we've seen the, uh, the financial issues of both uh, NRL, the uh, ARU and the AFL. Uh, we, we thought they were grand financial institutions, but faced with a, uh, a fairly catastrophic event, they're in fact not as financially stable as what we thought. Yeah, I think there needs to be a strengthen on governance in sport in general, um, in that space, and I don't think a lot of businesses plan for a pandemic, even though um, business continuity and resilience planning really um, require crisis management and pandemic pre-planning. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't think they think that far ahead. And I think you could probably draw that same conclusion for personally as well, Ainsley. Mm-hmm. Um, people generally, if they're in a good time, they don't save. And Australians particularly are not a nation of savers. No. And you could say, in, in fact, I'm reminded, I actually had a, uh, a dinner with a clinical psychologist some 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And he said at the time that we desperately needed a recession. And I said, why, why, the, why would we possibly want a recession when we didn't have to have one? And he said, because people have had it too good. They've never heard the word no in the workplace, financially, um, what they've got, they've just gone out and got um, what they needed, uh, they've just gone out and got it. And then not too many years after that, there was the GFC. Uh, GFC, that's right. So, you know, we've, we've had, an, in Australia, we've had probably 28 years of unparalleled economic growth. So people joining the workforce in the last 20 years have never had to save. And I think that's probably a, a good lesson for going forward. We all need to have some financial resilience and the impact, I think, on um, you know, people being able to take money out of their superannuation as part of this going forward is going to have some sort of impact as well because there's been like quite a bit of money taken out of superannuation. There has been, Deb. Uh, I was actually quite surprised when the government announced that um, because, as you know, when, you're, when you don't retire for many, many years, to take out 10000 at an early stage, it, that has a significant long-term impact. Uh, and even if you said, uh, you know, that money doubles supposedly every eight years or thereabouts, uh, you know, if you've got 24 years left, $10,000 now is actually $40,000 in, in, in that period of time. Mm. And how are you finding um, the mental health of staff sort of taking them through this journey at the moment we, as a board and a director and... Look, every organisation is different. You see, my, uh, my old accounting firm does two weekly surveys of all of their staff. Yeah. It's a very simple yes, no, you know, rate how you're feeling uh, because there is a, a real concern about the potential mental health of people. Uh, I think it'd be fair to say that you know, one in, I think one in seven people already had mental health conditions before COVID. Uh, I, you know, I think mental health is something that uh, we're just coming to terms with in terms of what an impact that does have on not only your personal life but also those around around them. And with some of the school boards that you sit on, how are parents coping with you know coming up with the school fees? What sort of measures are the schools putting in place to deal with that? Good question, Deb. Uh, if every uh, school is slightly different. Um, we're in. Um, there are some schools that just gave a blanket discount of maybe 10% for the next term school fees, and that's the private school sector I'm talking about. But then if you're a multimillionaire, then you're, giving, you're getting a discount, and it's not really going to those who, who really need it. Uh, so the school boards that I sit on, the two that I did, uh, there's been an additional allocation into bursaries for the next term to assist those people who really need 
uh, some support, some financial support. Because the initial reaction uh, from both school boards were, we're going to have a lot of people here who have lost their job. And in fact, Vinnie's have actually received a lot of phone calls from people who may have been on anything from, say, let's say, 80 to 100 grand, who have never called on Vinnie's for support in the past. And in the last three months, they've rung Vinnie's to say, I don't know what to do. I've got three kids in private school. I've got a mortgage with a home and with a car. How am I going to survive on $1,500 a fortnight? Are you leveraging off some of that insight, Dan, and um, how you're balancing that with the school boards and sort of saying, well, we could be preempting some of these um, sort of financial difficulties for families in that space? And I think that's the benefit of sitting on you know, a multitude of boards, mm. mainly that you can pick up uh, insights from, say, the Vineyards and the not-for-profits and, and put those into the school community. Mm. Uh, and, and both boards were already on the front foot in relation to that. Yeah. And even, I guess, the children's mental health too, um, how they might be impacted within their own households as well if, you know, suddenly mum and dad or one family member's lost their job and the financial pressures and... Um, you know, maybe the potential of having to change schools and how that might make those children feel at the time. And We know that when, when families get uh, moved uh, from one location to another, and I'm not specifically here, referring here to domestic violence situations, mm. but you can, in fact, draw that parallel. When you take a family out of an existing situation and put them in a, in a brand-new place, the kids are probably the least um, had look, looked at and, and yet they're the most vulnerable. Mm. They go to a brand new school, they don't know anyone there, they don't have the appropriate school uniforms, and they're behind the eight ball right from day one. Right, so Vinnie's, in fact, uh, has a fairly significant education fund, and we will provide uniforms, clothes, um, uh, books, and whatever kids need mm. to better assimilate in those situations from day one. Yeah, that's really great to hear. And um, with the you know, being part of a national organisation, Dan, how are you finding the disconnect between federal and state government? Are you getting mixed messages in terms of um, border opening, closures, etc.? And how does that really impact on a national organisation? I'm not a political figure, so no. I'm not going to go where the, uh, where the border controls are. I think um, I'd have to say uh, the federal government have probably reacted extremely well to this pandemic, uh, Look, not, every, not one size fits all. Um, they've had to do things very, very quickly on the fly. Uh, you know, it's $1,500 fortnight adequate for someone who's on 120 grand and loses their job overnight. Uh, and yet, to draw a parallel with that in, in a family in, in financial trouble, I've also got a story of a 19-year-old who was probably on $400 a week who now gets double mm. that, lives at home with her parents, and says, well, what the hell am I going to do with $3,000? So she's gone out and bought a handbag for $3,000. <laughs> Can I have her life? <laughs> <laughs> so you see the, the, the very different ways of, of dealing with the crisis. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, too, um, it's, it is, like you say, a very individualised circumstance. It is. And, and, and one size doesn't fit all. No. No, definitely not. But unfortunately, that's the way how... We have to go in in, in very emergency, emergent uh, situations. Mm. You know, I think from a board point of view, we have to make decisions very quickly. We don't necessarily get one week's notice of board papers. We have to be very flexible uh, in this very difficult time. And I think too, management teams are really looking to boards at the moment to draw on their knowledge and experience and trying to help them navigate through really uncharted waters. It's uncharted for everyone. Mm. Uh, and, and one of the difficulties is that if, if everyone's working from home, you don't actually have that face-to-face interaction. You can't whiteboard problems as easily as you maybe used to. Mm. So do you think your board meetings will go back to face-to-face or think it'll uh, be a combination? I think it's probably going to be a combination, Deb, going forward. Uh, once you get used to the technology, it's easily, uh, it's easily used. But I think there's always a, uh, always going to be that need for a face-to-face interaction. I think humans generally like face-to-face. I'd hate to think that uh, workplaces in the future will all be working from home. Yeah, I think too, though, it does kind of open up that um, flexibility that 
uh, might have been a closed mindset in the past. I think a lot of organisations have deemed work from home um, as a, a bit of a thorn in the side that they didn't really want to explore and um, they've kind of had to accelerate their um, flexible work offering and their digital transformation strategies and I think some management teams and boards are quite pleasantly surprised that businesses are still functioning quite well. I'd I'd say that's a a perfect scenario Uh, and just to to, to take to take one profession, you know, the medical profession probably argued for many, many years that you couldn't do medical consults over the phone or on, oh, on video. Yeah. And then all of a sudden now we've got digital health uh, and, and it's quite considered to be a, a normal way of doing business. Yeah, I think that it would still have its challenges of uh, checking your, your breathing or your uh, say R into the phone. <laughs> I, I think there's an inherent danger, though, if we rely upon so much... Uh, working online, mm. then, uh, and this is just a personal perception, Australia has a very high cost of labour mm. relative to our international peers. And if we embrace totally working from home and doing work online, then I think a lot of businesses will then look offshore to say, well, if, if it's acceptable to be working online, we can do it at half the cost or a quarter of the cost by using staff offshore. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, that's a real um, minefield for a lot of businesses. Mm. I think also for a lot of businesses, the, um, the, the capex that's, or the money that's spent on leases, um, if you've got more people working from home, you can save quite substantial amounts of money, right? Correct. Uh, I'm personally invested in quite a number of uh, real estate investment trusts, and I think that's probably one of the, the biggest outcomes from COVID, that, that all firms will then say, well, if, if, if 20% of my staff are working from home, I need 20% less room, mm. less commercial space. Yeah, and even having like a rotational um, sort of schedule where certain percentage each week work from home and just to give that flexibility across the whole office. Yeah. Um, look, I, I worked many, many, many years ago, uh, 30 years ago in London, and I was quite surprised when I first arrived there in 1986 that not everyone had a desk. And you only got a desk in a room depending on your level of, uh, uh, of profile within the firm. And I said, what's all this about? And they said, this is all hot desking. Because the high cost of real estate in London was just prohibitively expensive and therefore all junior staff either worked at a client or worked from home or didn't work at all, as the case may be. And I think... That scenario has never really been fully embraced in Australia. Um, no, I think too the hot desk scenario in Australia, they still had a, a desk space for every individual. In a lot of firms, they do. Yeah, have a desk space, and you know when you're working out of out of the office quite a bit, it's a largely empty desk space, and mm. that comes at a financial cost to a business. Well, I think going forward, once we've embraced working from home concept, then maybe the need for commercial real estate won't be as high as what it used to be. Mm. I think accounting firms have been quite good at adopting the, the hot desking, though, obviously, because if you, the, with the audit, auditors being out of the office. In my old accounting firm, everyone had a, had a seat, but there are okay. some other firms that don't, don't give seats to everyone. Yeah. You put your stuff in the locker at night and then run in in the morning and try and get the best seat. Mm. <laughs> Unless they're still sleeping under the desk in a sleeping bag. <laughs> Depends how busy your audit is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so in terms of um, digital technology strategy, Dan, do you think um, Vinny's are, well, are Vinny's looking at something to, uh, I guess, kind of embrace digital technology strategy going forward? Um, I know uh, one of my daughters, um, as part of their digital tech assignment last year, semester um, they looked at uh, Vinny's app for bushfire to try and um, partner up volunteers with sort of uh, businesses and homes and personal people that needed help during that time to kind of have an app that sort of put those two parties together Uh, are you looking at um, a different digital tech strategy going forward digital digital strategies change all all the time uh, in in the last twelve months, it's been a very, you know, and COVID being aside, you know, we've had all the bushfires uh, nationally that have had a devastating impact, particularly in uh, regional 
um, areas. Then we had the floods. Um, so each of that, our reactions have got to change for the, for the course. And therefore, um, because we're an organisation of volunteers, largely, um, we have to embrace technology, although sometimes um, for people in particularly far regional areas, they don't have the internet coverage that we are so used to on the Gold Coast and, and in Brisbane. Mm. And that's, that's uh, an issue in itself. Are you looking at maybe some strategic partnerships with, um, you know, large telco carriers of maybe sort of if somebody is a volunteer, maybe giving them some sort of look at some sort of partnership rate with those telcos? Yes, we have those in place already. Um, we always put our hand out and we'll take whatever we can get mm. in terms of, uh, you know, free phones or uh, free communication costs. But it is very difficult for those, you know, particularly out west. Mm. So when the JobKeeper payments stop um, end of September, obviously, obviously there's going to be a lot more unemployment, a lot more people stretched. Does Finney's strategy look that, that far out? We have, Deb, uh, and that's where we think we're, we're potentially going to be in for a bit of a world of hurt. Uh, whilst uh, Finney has nationally have been arguing that the new start allowance that I think used to be at $590 a fortnight, should have been increased. Uh, and, and for that allowance to have been doubled was an absolute godsend uh, for those people who, who are really struggling. If it goes back to where it was previously, those people are still going to be ringing venues on a regular basis for support. So we'd like to see at least an increase in the, in the base new start. Uh, have those people saved the additional funds in the six-month period? will be the big unknown question. I suspect they probably haven't. You know, coming back to that individual financial resilience, um, and they've probably spent the money that they or additional funds that they've received. Uh, and, and therefore, I think the demand on our services come, come around September when the JobKeeper and Seeker allowances reduce. Uh, well, I, I think our, the demand will be quite significant. I guess one of the other challenges is there's a lot of other competing charities out there competing for the donations. It's challenging, oh, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I, I think that... Look, I, I don't know, I can't speak for any other charities, but I think if, if, if there was a general comment, I think all charities are going through the same exercise that we are, what's worthwhile going forward? Maybe some shops might close going forward. Uh, you know, the quality of donations that we've received in the last few years has actually probably dropped... We're not getting the furniture that we used to. Uh, typically, typically, when you're clearing out, you know, mum and dad's house, uh, you know, as they moved into, say, retirement, those people might ring up Vinnie's and say, come and pick up the furniture. And as soon as we had people being taken off the street, put into a unit, that furniture was then recycled into someone who really needed it. Mm. But we're not getting that uh, quality furniture anymore. I think a lot of people do um, try and resell and recycle themselves these days. A lot of people use Gumtree and Facebook Marketplace and things like that that yep. are probably, as you say, taking those donations away from organisations like yourself that could potentially re repurpose them. Yep. And we've got to look at other ways of how you know, we might provide furniture for those people in need. Maybe another app, Dan. Uh, we've... Look... I don't want to give away all the strategies, no. but um, you know we've we've uh, we've contemplated actually buying it in mm. for manufacturers offshore, assembling it here in Australia, and providing it to the homeless that way. Mm. Well, I think uh, as we uh, wrap up our latest episode of Wise Up, Dan, thank you so much for um, joining us today and for your fantastic insights and um, giving us a bit of insight on. Um, COVID and the response that you guys have taken and um, how that may help some other organisations. And hopefully you get to Cuba in 2021. <laughs> well, I certainly hope so, Deb. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think that uh, you know, we will have the borders open sooner rather than later. Um, but anyway, I'm not in charge of those decisions. Uh, but the sooner we can get back to our typical normal, I think the better it will be for all of us. Anyway, thanks for having me and uh, just a reminder for those people who would like to support Venny's, CEO Sleepout, 
uh, please go online and, uh, and help us out because I think we, uh, we will really be in some need come around September time. Absolutely, and we'll post a link on that to our show notes page and um, on our LinkedIn post. So thanks again, Dan, for joining us today for another episode of Wise Up. And thank you to our listeners and tune in for our next episode. Thanks, Dan. Cheers. That's all for today. Until next time, happy podcasting. And remember, if you're enjoying the show, check out our other episodes and all things governance at www.threewiseowls.com.au.